stargazers are in for a treat this weekend because the L Leonid meteor shower will light up the night sky in a dazzling display. The best time to see the spectacle above the UK this year will be between midnight and before dawn in the early hours of Saturday. Oh, we might just see it then. Yeah. The Leonids are one of the more prolific annual meteor showers. They're usually fast, bright meteors and are associated with comet Temple Tuttle. Mm, nice. nice name. Temple Tuttle, a bit like Tittle Tattle. OK, let's bring in space and planetary scientists. Andy Lound, a man who gets more, the most enthusiastic man about space you'll ever meet. So the big question is, this sounds amazing, Andy. Of course it does, but are we going to see it? Because it's raining cats and dogs, there's going to be loads of cloud. Uh, good morning. Well, no, if it's raining, you'll have had it, I'm afraid. So we always need a clear sky. But even if there's wispy cloud, it's still worth going out because the beauty of uh, the Leonids is the fact that they are usually very bright meteors. So they're, they're more like fireballs in, in many cases. And although we'll, we'll get quite, normally get quite a lot, which are quite faint, you get a high majority of very bright ones here. And that's because a lot of them are entering the atmosphere at a very, very fast pace. And that's simply because the, the debris from this comet, Temple Tuttle, um, the, is, uh, the, the comet is a retrograde. It goes around the sun in a very different form to many other comets. And it's only every 33 years it goes around. So it leaves quite a good debris field. And these enter the Earth's atmosphere at a fantastic rate. So you get these very big, bright meteors. So even if there's wispy cloud, it's worth going out to take a look just in case. And although the peak is this weekend, it will be worth having a quick look on the 21st of November as well, um, because the debris which was distributed from this comet in 1766 were likely to be hitting a thick part of that on the 21st of November. So we get a double bang here. There might be a good opportunity to see some extra stuff on the 21st. Is there anywhere specific we should go if we want to watch it, or can we just go out into our gardens and look up at the sky? Preferably always go to the dark sky, uh, go to an area that's dark, away from light pollution if you can. That's always going to be the best thing to do. The problem is, of course, in a city you've got lights, street lights and all sorts of things. So go to a dark site if you can. If you are stuck in the city or you're stuck in, in a suburbs area, look at the darker part of the sky. It's called the Leonids because the trails appear to come from the constellation Leo. Um, that's just a line of sight effect, but they will come over across all parts of the sky. So always look in the darkest part of the sky, and if you can get to a dark site, go out and observe from there. But as always, what we say in astronomy now is be safe when you go out observing. We, we hear and um, we, see, we see movies on Netflix about the possibility of an asteroid ever hitting the Earth. Uh, at the moment, Andy, a lot of people might want yes. that to happen with the way of the world is going. <laughs> is that ever likely or is that just like another um, space scare story? That will happen at some point, yes. I mean, it might, it, it might happen in a couple of months' time, but it might not happen for half a million years. It is going to happen. It, it, it's, it's life. It's the way the universe works. It's the way the solar system works. We get bombarded a lot of the time, I think. I think the closest approach we're going to get is, is still somewhere 30 or 40 years before we get something that's going to get reasonably close to us. That isn't a scare story. These things happen. Uh, impacts on the Earth are very important because they distribute materials to the Earth, but also they've changed the course of life on the Earth. At least two occasions, impacts have actually changed the course of life on this planet uh, and led to the rise of us, for instance. The dinosaurs were wiped out by the impact 66 million years ago. Um, that led to the rise of mammals, which eventually led to us. So we owe our lives to such an impact. And again, we could be wiped out by such an impact again, which would change things. That is the nature of the solar system. Andy, there's another story today, the SpaceX test launch. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, the SpaceX are testing their, their big booster. This is quite an exciting thing. You may remember that uh, some months ago they tested their heavy launcher. The idea was to launch their vehicle. This is just the top section of it here. And the idea was it not to go into orbit, but to fly around the Earth and then uh, crash into the sea. It's an aerodynamic re-entry test is what they're trying to do. And of course, as you know, it, it, uh, the, the stages didn't separate and it had to be detonated from the ground in this mag magnificent explosion which took place. Um, and there was, there was an enormous number of changes, of well over a thousand changes needed to be made to the vehicle. I think there are something like 600 critical changes needed to be made to the vehicle, which was the whole point of the test. When you're doing engineering, and this is what I like about Elon Musk, he understands engineering, that regardless of what you do on a computer, until you physically do it, you're not really sure what's going to happen. 
And then when it fails, you can see where it's failed and start to put those corrections into place. So the idea is to do this again. So to see, firstly, to launch it, get from the launch pad to see the launching system works, then for it to separate, and then it will fly partly around the world, won't go into orbit, but we'll go into space, we'll go partly around the world. Uh, and the idea is that it'll be crashed, just or, or rather re-enter and land in the sea off the coast of Hawaii, well, some distance off the coast of Hawaii, um, as an aerodynamics re-entry test. So this is really quite an important test for it. This must be successful, otherwise you can't go into the next stage. So if this fails, they'll have to see what goes wrong and then do this one again, um, because, of course, this is the spacecraft which has been destined to land the first American astronaut on the moon since Apollo 17. So there's a lot riding on this. And, of course, this spacecraft then, the idea is it'll be fully reusable and then will be reused. Um, the future ones will be reused then to take people to the moon and possibly even over to Mars. As well as your, you know, your uncontainable enthusiasm for space, one thing I love about having you on is you always have a visual prop. Um, would you mind showing us your rocket again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hold it up. Yeah, sure. Let's see your rocket. Uh, we got the... Wow. It's an enormous piece of kit. <laughs> that, that's a whopper, mate. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Superb. Oh, one, have one, have a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's getting, this is getting a bit carry on. Um, can I ask you, Andy, um, on, a, on, a, on a related note, but unrelated, I want to ask you about solar cycles, because we always hear about climate change and it's caused yeah. by man. But one thing that people always mm. talk about is solar cycles. This just mm. happens anyway. Can you just give us a very quick idiot's guide to why the fact the climate has always changed and it's because of this big orange thing in the sky? Yeah, the solar cycle, which is roughly about 11 years, is a cycle that was observed um, really in detail since the 19th century, but we've actually got the records back showing it. And you get more, during the peak of the solar cycle, when the sun pumps out more material, uh, you get more sunspots forming across it, and you get what's called the butterfly effect, which is what, what, what scientists do when they chart these things down. And we get bombarded with... Um, solar radiation, the solar wind, which causes our atmosphere to swell and it causes uh, localised climate change. And, uh, we, we do get some alteration, but the, the heat from the sun and stuff, it gets absorbed by the ocean. This is a normal cycle that's continuous. We think there could be within that or beyond that, for instance, longer cycles that take place which affect the climate on the Earth. But that's something that's gone on constantly and we can actually look at the historical records of that, mainly through through dendrochronology, looking at tree rings and things like that, we can see what the sun has been doing over a period of time. We can look at the geology as well of our planet, and that gives us an indication of what's been happening. Uh, and then people say, oh, well, that, that's what's causing climate change. Well, the answer is no, because it is causing some level of climate change, but it isn't the only factor. There's additional factors which are going in there. And the additional factor which you can actually add into it all, funnily enough, turns out to be uh, human activities.